Um, so welcome to the stage. We've got uh, Natalie Gavin. Uh, she describes herself on her Twitter bio as proud redhead. Uh, <laughs> uh, also plays uh, plays the girl in the Arbor. And then we've got Adele Stripe, who's written uh, the new book uh, Black Teeth and Brilliant Smile, and is the kind of the go-to person if you want to know things about um, Andrew Dunbar. So, um, so hi both. Um, so first, I want to ask. Uh, ask Natalie about how you ended up in the film. Um, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, it was open auditions. Is that all right? Is it a bit weird? Is that all right? Yeah, I just won't move. Um, it was open auditions at Buckshaw School. And um, my agent, I had an agent at the time, had only ever done one acting job. Can I get it out? Can I get it out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Give it a go. That's better. Yeah. Um, and that it was at Buttershaw School as well. Um, I didn't know very much about what they were wanting to do. Um, I had a few sides um, from Rita Sir and Bob too. And then um, I met Amy Hubbard and Clio Bernard in the room. Um, they didn't explain very much either what it is they wanted to do. We went through um, a few stages, so we were kept there all day, um, going in and out of the room, and yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> and you've, uh, so you've done film and you've done theatre, and in the in the film, obviously, a lot of the bits are um, when you're performing the arbor, kind of surrounded by, I'm assuming, we're just residents. Um, yeah, yeah. Back and so. Did it feel almost like you were doing a piece of theatre or, or like a... a Street theatre, yeah. Um, but I suppose it still had that same concept because they weren't performing to them really. So it was very much, yeah, I think it was good to have this sort of television film um, drama ability to be able to just cancel everybody off, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. and just to vibe in this little bubble. Because uh, it, it was it was so difficult, me and Jimmy Mystery found it so bizarre because there was people that didn't understand that we were filming and there were so many different cameras and they were on the phones, they were going, hey, yeah, you should come down to Arby, you know, they're filming, they're filming and they're like, shh, and they're like, oh, sorry, 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 and they're like, oh, we'll do that again. So, um, yeah, it took, especially Jimmy, bless him, it took him a while to to get a grip and because we're horses and carts, you know, um, just toddling down the road, he's like, there's a horse there. And we're like, yeah, it's the Arbor, that's why. Um, but I loved it, yeah. So to have that theatre skill and TV skill, I guess, really worked for that aesthetic. And, uh, and Clio kind of uh, spent about a year and a half, didn't she? Um, kind of backpack on, um, kind of going around and interviewing people. I, I read that she'd got 90 hours worth of material, but some people say it might even be a little bit more. Um, so she obviously built up like a trust in the in the community by kind of literally doing the footwork around about. So what was the reaction like with everyone as you were doing it? Um, she didn't alienate anyone. Like she welcomed everybody when we were when we were on set when we were on the harbour, where people lived, you know, she made sure that everybody knew what it is that they were doing and felt more than welcome to come and get involved. Um, she didn't shut off um, the harbour, she didn't shut off any of anything that she was doing. Um, I worked with my boyfriends at the time and they were knocking on the door going, do you want to get involved? I'm like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute, do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> she was just letting other res residents to know that they, you know if you want to take part, be involved in this, what we're trying to create, please. She was so welcoming. Yeah, two years I heard that she'd um, done her work. She's such a clever, clever woman to, um, to produce what she produced. So we're showing The Selfish Giant as well uh, this week, which was like a follow-up, which is more of a feature film. Um, <coughs> Apparently for that she got, um, the council kind of didn't let her go back and film around those areas. Uh, oh really? So she had to um, kind of make some alternative 
plans. Um, and then her, I should say as well that her new film that's coming out at uh, the start of next year, uh, Dark River, uh, we might have some exciting news about that soon. Uh, if you do want to see, there are some advanced previews at uh, Leeds Film Festival at the moment as well. Um, so you can kind of catch it there. So she's kind of returning again, which is quite nice. So, um, so Adele, um, how did you end up becoming a resident Anthony Dunbar? No, no, at all. That sounds bad. Um, it was kind of when you did your PhD, wasn't it? Yeah, I did my PhD at Huddersfield, and um, I was at Father Landry as, as a teenager, and I kind of forgot about her, really. I remember watching a documentary on her uh, called In Praise of Bad Girls, The Great North Show, um, which she made with Kay Meller in 1989, which was her last recorded interview, and the footage you see in the arbor of her sat in the cinema seat, smoking a cigarette, that was all from that documentary, and it was only screened in Yorkshire, and I remember, vaguely remember seeing that when I was quite young, um, and I, I kind of wanted to be a playwright, I had, I had aspirations to do that um, when I was young, but I didn't know how to get there. Um, I didn't know anybody who'd been to university. I didn't know how I would become a writer. Um, I was just kind of grew up in a house without books. So people like Andrea and Sheila Delaney were kind of the model in a way. Um, the, the, and so <coughs> that would kind of happen when I was a teenager. Um, and then I, watched, obviously a fan of Read to Sue and Bob too, and I grew up in Tadcaster, which was a complete shithole. Um, not in the sense of um, it, it being kind of massively poor, um, but it, w it wasn't kind of, the poverty wasn't entrenched there, but it was a town full of raging alcoholics. And there were three breweries there, and I remember growing up, and you know, Sue's dad in Read to Sue and Bob too was the kind of man that Tadcaster was full of. And so I felt really connected to her um, in that sense that, that she was writing about these people that I recognised. Um, and then I watched The Arbour in 2010. And I was like, Andrea, and I'd forgotten about her. Somebody must have written a book about Andrea. So I went online, and every, every website I could find, a lot of it was talking about Clio's film, but nothing about Andrea. I couldn't find the solid facts, and I wanted to read a book about her because I just thought she was such a compelling character. Um, and I couldn't find a book anywhere, no one had done it, and I decided I was going to do it, and that was it. So I kind of took took it on, and I did a PhD at Huddersfield, and that was quite useful for me because I was close <coughs> um, geographically <coughs> to the area, and I just live in Mindenroyd, so it's just down the road, um, <coughs> and that, that is how it started. Um, and the book actually didn't happen until I'd finished my PhD, really. Um, the bones of it were in my PhD, but then the book came out of that. Great. Um, that was the book. <laughs> um, I suppose um, you were in a, a bit of a similar situation to Kaya in the fact that um, she talks about how it's hard to make a documentary when people have different versions of things that may have happened and then uh, you have an hour and a half to kind of come up with a, a version of events. Yeah. You must have found that the same thing as well. Yeah, I mean I was also looking, but I, I was really interested in Andrea herself, the character, but also her work um, and I dug into the kind of historic social background of that time, um, Bradford, what was happening in Bradford at that point, um, and what Andrea was telling us about Bradford at that time. 
So my PhD looked at that, and that kind of works its way into the novel as well, I think. But again, it's pulling in lots of different sources, uh, documentary, film, also parts of the arbor, you know, there's, there's facts in the arbor that I used in the book as well. Um, so it, it is this kind of bricolage effect. Um, and, and dialect as well. Yeah. Because I'm a Derbyshire boy, so <laughs> I, I don't get a lot of these. Uh... Well, the, I was just talking to Natalie about this, and the Dunbars have a really distinctive way of talking. The family speak in a certain way. And I pick that up listening, I just closed my eyes listening to, to the Arbour again and listening to Pamela talk and uh, Kathy and they've just got such a particular way of talking to each other and I was transcribing phonetically at various points, listening to them talk, how did they pronounce their words and that obviously influenced how Andrea speaks mm. in the book. And Natalie, you're rehearsing for Shirley at the moment? It yes. looks like I've made no effort at all to come and speak to you. <laughs> um, it's awful, sorry. Um, yeah, we're rehearsing um, Shirley, which is Andrea Dunbar's final play. Um, so we were performing here on the 9th of November, Square Chapel. But it's sold out, so you can't come if you don't have a ticket. If you don't have it, they might have. <laughs> so was this helpful for you in terms of um, kind of going through that process at the moment of rehearsing? Yeah, because um, I was saying to Adele, I said, Do you know, it'd be a really good idea to watch it, because I've not watched it for years. Um, so the last time I watched it was 2010, 11. Um, gosh, no one, re no one expected... I didn't even quite expect the mass of success with the Arbor. Um, I was saying to Adele, when, we first, when I first got on board, she literally just gave me a blank disc with no picture, De Clio, and she said, I just heard voices. And I was like, um, it was there supposed to be a picture on it. And she was like, well, we are going to create the picture. I was like, oh. I didn't quite understand what she meant by it. Um, but when, when, when we watched it, you know, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, so, yeah, I've not seen it probably in about six years. Um, and to know what I know about her family, and I'm still quite close to members of Andrea Dunbar's family, um, gosh, I, I see it through different lenses. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really, it was really quite hard to watch. Um, where before I didn't feel... I felt like I knew a lot about Andrea that had already been sort of expressed, you know, either through um, what what was accessible. That I feel like I know her differently now, and her family differently in situations, and I, I say, yeah, I look at it differently. I mean, the, 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 we we were talking about Lisa um, before. Uh, Andrea's daughter, she's got cancer, um, and I think she's 36, yeah. um, and Lisa is an incredible person, and she's got her mother's black wit, and she's hilarious, absolutely hilarious, and she doesn't want people to feel sorry for her because she's dying, you know, she's, she's not like looking for sympathy or pity. Um, and it, she just jokes about it. You when, know? I, when I first, <laughs> I'd not seen her for a, a good while, and it, um, we went to see Adele talk about um, Adele's book about Andrea, and uh, I, I, I saw her, I spotted her across the room, so I, I shot over, and she was sitting down, and she, she looked quite frail. I was like, are you all right? Are you not well? And she went, I'm dying of cancer. The reason why I found out is because I was pregnant, but I lost it. I like, yeah. Um, she went, don't you dare cry. And I went, she went, yeah, I, had, I was supposed to have three mums, but I'm still here, so. Yeah. Is what it is. She got married last <laughs> week. <laughs> she got married last week, yeah. yeah. Bless her. She is tough as old boots. Yeah, she she's is. just, she's amazing. She's just like a mum. She's very, very funny. Like Straight up, no messing about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's probably a good chance to open it up if anyone's got a question. No one wants to ask. And I can go 
to a question from the box. Um, so in the box we have, um, what is the essence of Andrew Dunbar's genius? I can't remember what I said now. <laughs> Expressing truth, that's what I said. How she expresses what she knows to be real, because it's real to her and her world, in the way she delivers it to the outer world. Is her genius, if that makes sense. That's what I believe, anyway. <laughs> I, th I think she was a whistleblower. And so what she was doing was reporting from the front line in the sense that uh, th there was no restrictions on the content. So the language and the characters and what happens in her plays were not kind of... <clears throat> subject to any restrictions in a sense of her education or anything like that. She just recorded it as it was. Mm. And she didn't care what people thought of her. And I think there's, there's something quite raw and energetic and punk rock about her writing now when we read it. Mm -hmm. What kind of thing do you think she would be writing now if she was still writing? I don't know whether she would be writing. That's that's what I was thinking. I didn't want to say it. Yeah, because writing was always bottom of her priorities of things to be doing. It was like fifth on her list of of important things in life, and she kind of did it because she was she had a strange relationship with writing. She kind of felt like she was forced to do it. She needed the money was important to her. Um, but also, I think she quite liked the status on the estate of being the writer and being in the pub and being the writer. I think that was quite important to her. But at the same time, she resented it. She hated it. She hated what it had brought, the trouble it had brought her in her life. And my book kind of digs into some of that, really. So she had a very strange relationship with the role of, of a writer. And I don't know whether long term she would have carried on. I hope she would have done. And it's almost like the pressure as well. It was a lot like of pressure for her. The pressure of everybody wanting her to produce. Yeah. I mean, when she died, there was loads of like outstanding scripts that she was supposed to have written that she never wrote. So I think, I mean, maybe eventually she would have got round to doing that, but... I think she'd abandoned quite a few. I mean, the, the pressure to be a good mom, the pressure to be a good writer, yeah. you know, the whole, you know, getting to grips with the whole new world of London, which would have been insane for her. With, I can't imagine that she stepped out of Bradford very often. You know, like, but it's she a took new it in role, a stride. New, new she went down to London and, and they were just talked down, people were talked down to her, I've heard this from people who witnessed it. And um, it was almost like, oh, she's the Northern girl. And she would, she could see through it all. She could see through all the bullshit. And there was, that's something quite wonderful about her, that she could immediately see through the false kind of theater world um, and come back to Buttershaw and laugh about it. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about Andrea. How many, how many other uh, kind of undiscovered Andrea Dunbar's do you think are out there? Loads. I think they're all out there now and they might just be making like YouTube clips. They might not be doing it in a formalised kind of theatre way, but they've got the technology. They can, they've got their little iPhones and they're making their own stuff and they just haven't been found yet. I think there are loads of them out there, personally. I've got faith in the youth. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know what you think. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, I agree, yeah. We just haven't found them yet, but they're out there and they exist. Oh, uh, we've got a question. <laughs> uh, we've got a microphone just here, so... Uh, Shall we uh, I think we're recording it, so if you oh, can okay. do it into a mic, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I 
I just want to say, I'm, I'm speaking at a conference in Bradford in, in three weeks. It's the WOW Festival. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and everyone's speaking about the Brontes. It's about badass women of Bradford. And I'm speaking about Andrea Dunbar. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I said I'd do that and realised I didn't know that much about her. So I suppose there's going to be hundreds of women from Bradford there. Yeah. What do you think they should know about her at the end of the talk? So I don't mean to. Well, she was the youngest playwright to have their work staged in the main theatre at the Royal Court, in the history of the Royal Court. I think that is like quite a major achievement for a young woman um, and, and quite a brilliant thing to aspire to. So at a, at a very young age, she had achieved a great deal and she won the George Divine Award um, her plays were staged, well, Read Soon Bob 2 was staged in New York. Um, so in terms of her actual writing, she did really well at, at a young age. And I think that's maybe the key, the key thing to remember. Despite everything that was against her, she kind of defied that and went on to have great success, even though she had a very short life. Um, but also, she worked in the mills, and this kind of doesn't get talked about very much, but she worked as a French coma. So she left school, she had one CSE in drama, which she got an A at, or, or English in drama. Um, so she, she, did, she had some really good teachers, and she talks about it in the documentary. Tony Priestley and Colin Smith really helped her. Um, so I, th I think that, that is another important factor that they nurtured her and encouraged her despite her kind of chaotic upbringing um, but she went to work at bowling mill and she worked there for about a year and a half and thought that would be her life because all of her family had worked in the mills up to that point um, but something within her held on to those scripts and diaries and notes that she'd made and then when she ended up uh, living at a women's aid refuge in Keithley, that was when her luck changed. And um, it was through Jalna, who was sat here tonight, that Andrew Dunbar ended up at the Royal Court. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anyone else got anything they want to ask? Uh, great, well, uh, we'll probably uh, leave it there then, as it is getting to. Uh, uh, get to my bedtime. Uh, we've got um, so a copy of Adele's book. Uh, they're available um, outside. Uh, I'll quickly jump onto box office. So if anyone needs to pay by card or anything like that, you can come and just see me afterwards. Um, she's here, happy to have you sign them and have a chat. Uh, Natalie, I'm surprised you're still Alive. actually awake. She's been here since ten o'clock this morning rehearsing. I know, full so. cold. <laughs> but I'm sure she'll be around here for a little bit longer in case you want to ask her anything. So um, thanks a lot for coming tonight. Uh, like I say, we've got the Selfish Giant here on Tuesday night. If you want to uh, see the next film that uh, Fire Well Now did, uh, we've got Shirley coming up soon, but unfortunately it's already sold out. So congratulations if you've got tickets, put them on eBay. Uh, you'll get a fortune. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks. <laughs>